genetics. Uh, I suspect that on the test, all we're going to have on the test is single trait genetics. So I've put a little practice problem set up on the Moodle site. Uh, the first page is dealing with single traits. The second page deals with two traits at a time. So ignore the second page for now. Uh, but you might want to work through the first page. And you can look at it right now, but it probably won't make a ton of sense to you until we've gone through kind of basic genetics. Before we can go through basic genetics, so we need to finish talking about meiosis, because meiosis is the process by which we form gametes. And gametes are the things that get passed on from generation to generation, and that's those are the things that are carrying our genes. So we started down the path of meiosis last time. Before we start, do you have any questions about what we were doing last time? Yeah. I did have a table. Can we just make that at the end? Yeah. Okay, cool. Other questions? All right. You'll remember, perhaps, that I said meiosis occurs in two phases of division. We call them meiosis 1 and meiosis 2. And we had started off talking about prophase. What are the things that happen that are unusual in prophase? Some things are, are similar to meios mitosis, rather, in that the uh, chromosomes condense. And uh, the nuclear membrane breaks down. Plus but what special happens in meiosis that doesn't happen in mitosis? Um, they uh, go to the center and get ripped apart? Nope, that would be in metaphase. Is it the pairing of homologous chromosomes? It is the pairing of homologous chromosomes, good. This is prophase one. So in this case, the homologous chromosomes become paired. What's the process by which that happens? Synapsis. Synapsis. So synapsis occurs. <laughs> and because they're lying right next to one another, what can happen to the ends of their chromosomes? Cross over. They can cross over. So synapsis occurs, and we can have crossing over. When crossing over occurs, what this does is it recombines alleles that weren't necessarily together on the same chromosome with one another. Because you have the, the chromosomes that the individual got from its mom and from its dad, and they, they interchange parts. And so this crossing over increases gamete diversity at a genetic level. And this becomes important when you're trying to maintain the diversity of, of a population of organisms. During metaphase one, you know what happens? Okay, they go to the center here. They line up along a metaphase plate, just like they did in mitosis. But they line up along that metaphase plate, not randomly distributed, they line up as homologous pairs. So they get lined up, but they don't get pulled apart until when? What's the phase where chromosomes always get pulled apart? Anaphase one. Now, in this case, what gets pulled apart are not the sister chromatids of each chromosome, but the homologous pairs get pulled apart. So in anaphase one, homologous pairs
And in this diagram, you see that the mainly blue one and the mainly green one get partitioned to different sides. And for this chromosome, the mainly green gets pulled to the same side as the mainly blue. Which ones go to which new cells is totally random. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. The homologous chromosomes that came, the, the chromosomes in a homologous pair that came from your male parent don't always travel around together, and your female ones all travel around together. They get lined up randomly along this metaphase plate, and depending on how they got lined up, that's how they get pulled apart, but that process is totally random. So you don't get If, you're, if the chromosomes that you got from your mom are colored purple, and the ones that you got from your dad are colored black, they line up at synapsis. They don't always line up like this, and then your mom's chromosomes go to one new gamete and your dad's go to another gamete. They can be totally randomly arranged. And that's what's shown up there. This becomes important from genetics because these chromosomes get independently assorted to the new gametes totally randomly. They don't, they don't get inherited together typically. Um, so that's what happens in anaphase one. And then telophase one involves the formation of, of two new cells. But these two new cells look just like the cells at the beginning of prophase two, so oftentimes books will, will combine prophase one and prophase two into the same, the same stage. Because they are indistinguishable from one another. When we started at the beginning of prophase one, how many chromosomes were in this cell? We have two types of chromosomes. We have two chromosomes of each type. So we have how many chromosomes total? We have four chromosomes, which equals two chromosomes of each of two types. The number of types is n, so this is a 2n or a diploid cell. At the end of meiosis one, we have two cells how many chromosomes do we have in each of those two cells? This cell has, you guys can count, right? This one, that one, 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 one. This one has, remember that when we duplicate a chromosome, when we duplicate Okay, the chromosome, this is referred to as a chromosome <coughs> made up of two chromatids. I told you this terminology was going to get confusing. So in this cell, how many chromosomes do we have? Two. two. In this cell, how many chromosomes do we have? Two. Two. Now we have four copies of DNA in each of those cells but we have two chromosomes in this form. So we went at the beginning of prophase one to the end, to the end of meiosis one with cells with two chromosomes. Where do you get 16? <laughs> the where the is beginning one? point where you did two times, you just yeah. compounded. Yeah. Oh, that's cell division. That's, that's yeah. mitosis. That's the number of cells. <laughs> the number of cells, so you start. You start with one cell, then you go to the two cell stage, then you go to the four cell stage, then you go to 16, 32, 64. Is that what you're thinking of? Yeah. This is, this is cell number two, two mitosis. Yeah. But you can see here, there's only two chromosomes, two chromosomes in two cells. <laughs> I'm not trying to mock you, it's just like, <laughs> work with me with what's on the screen. <laughs> okay, all right. So in our, in our new two cells that we have there, they have two chromosomes each. We have two cells. So we had four chromosomes that we partitioned into two cells. 
but we partition them in a way that each cell now has half the chromosomes that it had before. So we now have two chromosomes total, which means we still have two types of chromosome, but we only have one copy. And so the, the number of different kinds of chromosomes that we have is still the same, N, but we only have one of these, and this is what we refer to as a haploid cell. So when we talked about ploidy last time, this term ploidy that you guys didn't know or hadn't seen, ploidy refers to do you have two copies of each type of chromosome or do you have one copy of each type of chromosome? So during this first meiotic division, you go from having two copies of all of your chromosomes to only having one copy of all of your chromosomes. The reason that you need only one copy of the chromosomes is because ultimately at the end, you're going to have a pollen grain, which is one in. You're going to have an ovule, which is one in. These two things come together at fertilization. You get the one in from the male gamete plus the one in from the female gamete, which then gives you a diploid organism, and you're back to looking just like the parents in terms of the numbers of copies of chromosomes. So you go through this whole thing that is referred to as a reduction division. Because you have to reduce the amount of, of genetic material, because when you go to fertilize, you're going to then put those two reduced genomes back together again in an offspring to make a fully functional offspring. So when in the case of humans, humans have 23 different kinds of chromosomes. We have two copies of them. At the end of meiosis one, we will end up with one copy of our 23 chromosomes. This is how we make sperm and egg, and then when your parents got together, they <laughs> combined their chromosomes together to give you the 46 chromosomes that they had so that you are just like them in terms of numbers of chromosomes. Think about this if you didn't go through this reduction division. If there wasn't a reduction division during meiosis one, you would have sperm and egg with 46 chromosomes apiece, and then when fertilization occurs, you would have 92. And then when you go to reproduce with somebody else, they would have 92 plus your 92, and so your offspring would have 184 chromosomes. And very quickly, you would get so many chromosomes that you wouldn't have room for anything else in the cell in reality. Your cells would have to get bigger and bigger and bigger just to contain the genetic material. This reduction division in meiosis keeps genetic material constant from one generation to the next generation. So it's crucial for you to understand that as well. Questions about that? So it becomes haploid. At cell phase one and cell phase two? Mm -hmm. okay. Yep, yep. At, that, at this point, you're on the way to being a haploid, but it isn't until you actually form the cells that you can actually refer to those as haploid. But yeah, the important thing, though, is to know that in this first half of meiosis, that's when the differences between mitosis and meiosis occur. The differences are synapsis <coughs> crossing over. The metaphase plate is not individual chromosomes lining up at metaphase plate, but the homologous pairs lining up at metaphase plate. Anaphase is different because it's now homologous pairs being pulled to either side, not the sister chromatids being pulled to either side. And at the end, we now have two new cells, but they're not just like the cells that they came from. They're actually with half the genetic material that they had before. So, Almost everything is different in meiosis one than mitosis in reality. But those are the key things that you would need to remember. But the cool thing about this is once you get through meiosis one, 
Meiosis two is actually just like mitosis, except now we're doing it with two cells, each cell having half the genetic material that the parent cell had. So in, in prophase two, we're coming out of telophase one, so our, our chromosomes are already condensed. And the fact of the matter is a nuclear membrane doesn't even form in between these two phases. During metaphase two, No, what happens? No, no, that's always happens in what phase? They line up in the middle. They line up in the middle. Thanks, Charlie. So uh, the chromosomes line up. along the metaphase plate to form the metaphase plate. But in this case, it's the individual chromosomes with their chromatids. Spindle fibers go out and attach to them. And at anaphase two, what happens, Noah? Now they're getting pulled apart. They get pulled apart. But what's getting pulled apart in this case? So the centromere breaks. And what's getting pulled to this side and that side? Oh, I erased it. The crossover ones. So they cross. So we have these duplicated chromosomes held together by the centromere. This is a chromosome with chromosome made up of what? Sister chromatids. Two sister chromatids. Who was that? Okay. So in this case. What's getting pulled apart here? Somebody other than Charlie. Darren. Yes. Hmm? What's getting pulled apart? Caden. What's getting pulled apart? When the centromere breaks. Chromosomes. <laughs> It's the chromatids that are getting pulled apart. So in anaphase two, the sister chromatids they get partitioned into new cells, and then you end up with four new cells in telophase two. These four cells are all haploid, meaning they only have half of the number of chromosomes that the parent cell had back at the beginning of all of this. And they are all genetically distinct. They're genetically different from one another. Because of crossing over, this cell has a different chromosomal structure to it than this cell does. This one is different from that one. This one is different from that one. They are all slightly different because of the process of crossing over. And this is why none of your siblings look alike, is because during crossing over, the, the alleles get shuffled because of crossing over, exchanging genetic material from one chromosome to another. And then in the process of pulling the homologous chromosomes apart, and then pulling the sister chromatids apart, those crossed over portions get partitioned into different cells. And so we end up with four haploid cells that are all genetically distinct. Any questions about that process? These four haploid cells are either sperm or ova, or in the case of plants, pollen grains. These are the gametes. These are the things that are then going to go together at sexual reproduction to form a new individual. Sperm joins with egg, forms a new individual. Pollen grains, the cells in pollen grains, form with the ovule of the plant to form new individuals. And so this shuffling of genes that occurs in meiosis is important for getting diversity among the gametes, because that's important for getting diversity among the offspring that you have, genetic diversity among the offspring that you have. 
But this is just like mitosis in many ways. It's just a simple cell division where you separate sister chromatids at anaphase rather than separating homologous pairs of chromosomes at anaphase. So meiosis, the trick with getting meiosis is learning what all the differences are that occur in meiosis one. Now that we've gone through this, this is a, a figure from a textbook. What's wrong with that figure? There's a mistake in it. They're there, they're just really faint. Has to do with crossing over. In uh, anaphase 2, there's small ones next to big ones. Does that happen? Uh, they could have they been where? Here? Yeah, that one. They could have been flipped either, either way, it doesn't, doesn't really matter. If you have 23, they're going to be all jumbled up. Also, which one is, which chromatid is facing which way is also totally random, so it doesn't, you don't get, you don't always get the ones that have undergone crossing over going to one side and the ones that didn't going to the other side. That's random also. cells in cell phase two different than each other? They are. Why are they not different than each other? And they should be. Now what's up with beta phase two? All of a sudden in beta phase two, what did they get rid of? Everything got crossed over. They got rid of everything that got crossed over and somebody didn't catch it before it made it into a textbook. Yeah. So these should have tips that are different because we had the process of crossing over because they look like this in the, in the previous thing. And so, and in this one, only, oh yeah, this one, this one is fine and this one is fine. Yeah, so they just messed up this one. They didn't carry over the graphic from here to here in terms of maintaining that crossing over thing. So when you go back and look at this as you're studying, make that note in your notes that metaphase two here is messed up. You have to think through that yourself. It's very hard to create a textbook that doesn't have any mistakes in their graphics because oftentimes the graphics are generated by graphic artists, not the authors themselves. And there are so many figures in a textbook that it's almost impossible to catch all the mistakes that graphic artists make because the graphic artists aren't oftentimes trained as biologists also. <laughs> Those of you who are interested, are there any art majors? There aren't any art, we don't have art majors in the class, I don't recall that. If you're an art major, going into biological illustration is actually a pretty good, pretty good job to have. So when we think about mitosis and meiosis, you were asking about the table that we started. We can think about mitosis and meiosis and comparing them and, them and contrasting them by thinking of what process they are involved in. In the case of mitosis, you're involved in somatic growth. This is the growth of the body. Uh, in meiosis, this is involved in gamete formation. So, um, in you, mitosis is occurring all over your body as you're growing. Meiosis only occurs in your ovaries if you're female or in your testes if you're a male, uh, because that's where gametes are ultimately formed. How many cell divisions do we have in mitosis and meiosis? How many cell divisions in mito mitosis? Somebody said it. We go from a single parent cell to two daughter cells 
you're done. One cell division, how many cell divisions do we have in meiosis? Two. We have two. Meiosis one, meiosis two. There is no mitosis two because there's only one cell division. What's the ploidy of the parent cells in mitosis and meiosis? 23. Not 23, because remember, different, different organisms have different numbers of chromosomes. We have 23, fruit flies have four different chromosome types. What does ploidy refer to? So we have 20, we oh, have 23 sorry. different types of chromosomes. Go ahead. Yeah. So everybody starts out diploid. Diploid. Diploid, 2N, where N is the number of different kinds of chromosomes you have, which for us is 23, which for other organisms is a different number. At the end of mitosis, what's the ploidy of the daughter cells that come out? It's diploid. Yep, it's the same because there is no reduction division in mitosis. What is it in meiosis? It's haploid. Half the genetic material. Now, keep in mind that things like wheat, which are hexaploid, they start off with 6 n, and so they end up not as haploid gametes, they end up with triploid gametes because they are. But in all cases, they end up with half the number of gamete, uh, half the number of chromosomes in the gametes that they had in the parent cell. But for diploid organisms, it would be haploid. <coughs> for hexaploid organisms, it would be triploid because triploid is three is half of half of six. <coughs> Are daughter cells genetically identical at the end of mitosis? Yes, they are. Are they genetically identical at the end of meiosis? No, they're genetically distinct. This table encompasses these differences that are in this thing here. Don't just memorize what's in the table. The table is just one way of systematizing the information that is in the process. You also need to know the process. What I'm going to give you on the exam is I'm going to give you, just going to tell, I'm giving you what is on the test. I've done that now a couple of times. I'm going to give you images of phases of meiosis, and I'm going to give you images of phases of mitosis. And they won't be the same images, but they'll be similar in structure because you could just memorize, oh, my mitosis are the yellow ones, meiosis are the white ones, and that wouldn't really do much. You need to pay attention to what's going on with the chromosomes in the cells. And I'm going to ask you, based on the image, what phase of mitosis or meiosis is this? And you'll either, the first thing you have to ask yourself is, is this mitosis or meiosis? And you're going to know that because in meiosis, very early on, you'll have the pairing up of homologous chromosomes. Or in meiosis 2, you'll have two cells that are haploid going through cell division. And in mitosis, it ends at the production of two cells. So, so meiosis is really easy to distinguish mm -hmm. from meiosis because one is a single cell division, the other one is two cell divisions. In the first cell division, when you're going from one cell to two cells, the homologs are always traveling around together in meiosis, whereas they're, they're independent of one another in mitosis. So the first thing you have to figure out is, am I looking at a cell that's in mitosis, or am I looking at a cell that is in meiosis? And then once you know that you're in meiosis, then you have to say, am I working with one cell dividing into two cells, or two cells dividing into four cells? That tells you if you're in meiosis one or meiosis two. So you're going to get a set of images. Typically, it makes up a whole page of something like one, two, three, four, five, six images. And it's just an image. And it asks you to put what phase of mitosis or meiosis that image happens to represent. <clears throat> yeah. What picture is haploid? What is so it's haploid at this point because you have two cells. Each cell has half the number of chromosomes that you started with. So when I give you that, that series of photos, I'm going to tell you 
what the diploid number is. You know, if I have six chromosomes, then the diploid number is six. If I have four chromosomes drawn, the diploid number is four. So I'll give you this so that you can look and say, oh, the diploid number is four. I know this is a diploid cell because it has one, two, three, four chromosomes. I know this is a diploid cell because it has one, two, three, four chromosomes. This is a diploid cell that has one, two, three, four chromosomes. This is a diploid cell turning into a haploid cell because these four chromosomes are being divided in half. These are definitely haploid because they have one, two, one, two. Not diploid, haploid at that point. So in the question, I'll give you what this is. Otherwise, you wouldn't have any clue as to whether it was diploid or haploid, and that's one of the things you kind of have to know in order to figure it out. You can sit and memorize images, or you can learn what the process is. I would advocate learning what the process is because then whatever image you're presented with, you can use in your way through figuring out what phase you're in. Does that make sense? Questions? Other questions? Okay. So the reason that we went through all of that detail about meiosis in particular is because when we talk about genetics, we have to think about gamete formation. And gamete formation is done via meiosis. So this is Gregor Mendel. I don't know why I have his picture there, except that he's an old guy from the 1800s. Um, this is a pea flower, and the structure of the pea flower becomes very important for Mendel's work because it contains inside of that pea flower both the male and the female parts of the plant. Remember that the male parts of the plant are the anthers, the, the stamens with the anthers at the top, but the anthers are actually where the pollen grains are produced. They contain the male gametes, and then the female gametes are in the bottom of the pistil. Uh, these ovules are the female gametes. Because the pea flower is closed, you don't get a lot of cross-pollination from one pea plant to another. You get a lot of self-pollination. Pollen from these anthers fertilize the ovules in this plant. And so pea plants are notoriously inbred. And the cool thing about inbreeding is that if you inbreed organisms for a long enough period of time, they become genetically homogeneous within a line. They become what we refer to as homozygous for all traits. So I'm gonna go back and revisit some terminology that we covered earlier. I'm gonna do it maybe a little more formally this time. When we think about the two homologous chromosomes that we have, one of which you inherited from your dad, one of which you inherited from your mom. This is your, your chromosome one. Remember we talked about tongue rolling. Let's say that we have a tongue rolling gene. It occurs at the same spot on a particular chromosome. And we talked about how you can have a form of the gene that allows you to tongue roll, and you, there's another form of the gene that prevents you from tongue rolling. These different forms of a gene are called what? Allelate. Good. Who was that? Okay, good. Different forms of a gene are alleles. So you can have, in your genotype, copies of the allele that lets you roll your tongue, in which case you are homozygous. <clears throat> homozygous. 
this just means that you have two copies of the same allyl, or you can have one copy of the allyl that makes you a tongue roller and one copy of the one that would prevent you, in which case you are heterozygous. Where you have two different alleles for a gene, but you can also have two copies of the allele that prevents you from tongue rolling. So in this case, tongue rolling the trait is a strict dominant recessive trait. The dominant phenotype is tongue rolling. The recessive phenotype is not tongue rolling. So these phenotypes are determined by dominant alleles. In this case, we're going to indicate with a capital T and recessive mm -hmm. alleles that we will designate with a lowercase t. So this would be a homozygous recessive genotype. having the two alleles that prevent you from tongue rolling. And as a result, because you have two recessives, you can't roll your tongue. If you have two dominants, you are a homozygous dominant genotype. because you have two copies of the tongue rolling allele that makes you able to roll your tongue. So this individual has a phenotype. Now let me get rid of this because I'm out of space. This individual has a phenotype that is non-rolling. This individual has a phenotype that is a tongue roller. So what is the phenotype of this individual? This is a heterozygous individual. <coughs> What's their phenotype? Roller. Roller. They are rollers. Because a dominant allele, the way we would define what makes a dominant allele dominant is that it gets expressed if it is present in the genotype. If it's there, it's going to express itself. So all of you guys, because we determined one day that all of us could tongue roll, right? Everybody? Yeah, we're a class full of tongue rollers. In my evolution ecology, everybody but one person in the class can tongue roll. There's one guy who can't. When you roll your tongue, all I know about you is that you have one dominant allele for tongue rolling. You could be homozygous dominant, or you could be heterozygous. Phenotypically, we can't determine whether you're homozygous or heterozygous for that trait. We know that if you can't, you are homozygous because the only time you can not express tongue rolling is when you have no dominant allele present. And so, dominant alleles express themselves whenever they're present. Same thing with hitchhiker's thumb. We talked about hitchhiker's thumb. We know that you are you possess a dominant allele. We don't know if you're homozygous dominant or heterozygous. What I know about myself is I'm homozygous recessive because I can't do that. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. 
both my parents can do it, does that mean I'm probably homozygous? Um, there's a certain probability that you are. Okay. But for example, well, let's just let's just do that. Our first genetics problem. So Thomas, this is how you would work a, a genetics problem in, in class and on the test on Monday. Your mom and dad both have hitchhiker's thumb. Mm -hmm. Which means that we know that they are at least possessing one dominant allele. But we don't know what the second dominant allele is. What do you know about the hitchhiker thumb status of your siblings? They all have it. Oh, they all have it. Oh my god. So if they all have it, chances are they are homozygous dominant. Because if they are, then your, <coughs> your dad can only produce one type of gamete. Your mom can produce only one type of gamete. Which then means all, how many ch siblings do you have? Two. Okay, so it's not a huge sample size. So all of your siblings would then have the genotype that would give you hitchhiker's thumb. But now let's ask ourselves, you notice how I gave you a blank there to indicate that we don't know what that is. Well, let's say that your parents are heterozygous. Well, your dad can either produce this gamete, or he can produce this gamete. This gamete. Your mom can produce either that gamete or that gamete. We can build a little square where we put your mom's gametes across the top. We put your dad's gametes across the side. We bring these gametes over. We bring these gametes down. And we find that your parents, if they were both heterozygous, produce a homozygous dominant offspring, two heterozygotes, and one homozygous recessive. So three quarters of their offspring would be expected to be having hitchhiker's thumb. If only I could spell. And one quarter of them would be I'll just say normal. Not not possessing. Oh, oh sorry. Not normal. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. You can't hitchhike. So, so it could be that they're both homozygous dominant. But even if they're both heterozygous, you have a 75% chance of each child of any given child being, you know, having that trait. So it's not a stretch to think that all three of you might actually have hitchhiker sub, even if they were heterozygous. So there's just no way of knowing unless we did a genetic test on them. And why would we spend money doing a genetic test for such a lame trait as that? But this is what I can hitchhike. Yeah. Have you ever hitchhiked? No. No. <laughs> The safest place in the world to hitchhike is Mexico, as it turns out. I've, I've never hitchhiked in the United States. I've hitchhiked in Mexico a number of times. Where in Mexico? Uh, Baja California, uh, the Copper Canyon region in the state of Chihuahua. Um, just because I needed to get somewhere and didn't have a car, because I was far from the border. <laughs> so. Mendel worked on pea plants because pea plants turn out to be true breeding, what we refer to as true breeding. A true breeding plant is a plant that when you self it, when you allow it to self pollinate, Offspring have the same genotype, and as a result of that, phenotype as the parent. 
So genotype is the actual composition of alleles that you have. The phenotype is how those alleles get expressed, what you actually see when you look at the organism or measure something about it. And so true breeding occurs when you have multiple generations of selfing, self-fertilization. Uh, we use these kinds of lines. They're called, they're sometimes called isogenic lines. Uh, we use them in fruit flies. You can, you can create them if you collect a, fruit, a population of fruit flies, take all of the females, put each female in a, in a vial by itself, it lays eggs and then those eggs hatch. You let those siblings mate with one another, then you pull individuals out of there, put female, put another female in a, in a vial, allow it to lay eggs, its offspring mate with one another, pull a female out of there, and then just keep doing this. In 25 generations, 25 to 50 generations, you will end up with a bunch of separate uh, populations that are basically like 99% homozygous. So if you look at each trait that they have in their, in their genome, and you, you would sequence an entire genome, you would find that they're all genetically identical simply by forcing them to to inbreed over and over and over again. And so you've got true breeding peas because generation after generation after generation, these peas are fertilizing themselves, not cross-pollinating because insects can't get inside this flower because the floral parts, the, the sexual parts of the flower are all inside of the petals and the insects can't get inside of there. So he had these true breeding plants, but the true breeding plants all had different kinds of characteristics. And so he, he measured these. And so you can look at the height of the plant. It's either tall or it's short. The seed shape is either round or wrinkled. Uh, these traits up here are all dominant traits. These ones down here are all recessive traits. The seed color itself, the <coughs> inside of the seed, can either be yellow or green. The seed coat, which is the coating on the outside, can either be green or white. The pod can either be inflated or constricted. The color of the pod can be either green or yellow. And the position of the flowers can either be at the end of a stalk, oh, sorry, sorry, at the end of a stalk terminal, or they can come off the, the, the lateral stems such that they're axial in position. So he figured out what all of these traits were by basically taking, let's take seed shape for example, he took these true breeding round plants, crossed them with true breeding wrinkled plants, and when he crossed those, he got a population of round plants. All of the offspring were round. 100% of the offspring were round. When he then took these round plants and allowed them to self-fertilize for a generation, what he got out of that was he got three quarter of the population were round and one quarter of the population were wrinkled. So this term recessive that we have here, it comes from when he did these early experiments because the wrinkled character of the plants didn't go somewhere, it didn't disappear, it just receded to the background for a generation. So when you cross two plants of a known phenotype, the one that appears in the F1 generation, this is called the parental generation, this is called the first filial generation, the first generation after the parents, the, the one that appears in the F1 generation is the dominant phenotype, when you then allow those to self-fertilize, the one that reappears comes back from receding into the background. This is the one that receded. This is the recessive. So he did this. He did these <coughs> things, and he had no idea what a gene was. He didn't even know what a chromosome was. Chromosomes hadn't been discovered yet. This was work that he did back in the 1850s and 1860s. But from this, he was like, okay, how can I get nothing of the wrinkled appearing in this generation? And then with this very regular three quarter to one quarter, or a three to one phenotypic ratio, with three B 
being the dominant to one being the recessive trait, because once again, this is the one that recedes into the background. And what he surmised correctly, as it turns out, is that all these organisms must possess two copies of what he referred to as factors, the German word for factors. He was Austrian, spoke German. Uh, two factors. Each individual possesses two factors. And during the process of forming gametes, these factors get partitioned into gametes. Well, if you have two of the same type of factor, you can only produce one kind of gamete because they all, and you only have one type of, of allele to choose from. This individual can only produce one type of gamete. At reproduction, at fertilization, you get these two alleles coming out in a particular genotype. Only if you have two of them, though, can you get this three to one ratio, because what happens is exactly what we just did with Hitchhiker's thumb. This individual can now produce not one allele type in their gametes, but they can produce two. They can produce a dominant and a recessive. I got in the habit a long time ago of circling my gametes, just to remind myself that those are gametes, not genotypes. This individual can produce two types of gametes. And when we combine these gametes with one another through fertilization, we bring one type of gamete over, we bring the other type of gamete down. Because these are dominant, any place you see one of these, you're going to have the dominant phenotype expressed. Anytime you have the homozygous recessive, you're going to have the recessive phenotype. This gives us a three to one phenotypic ratio, exactly what it deserved. Now we have a one to two to one genotypic ratio of the homozygous dominant to two heterozygotes to one homozygous recessive. This is the genotypic ratio. Out of this genotypic ratio comes a three to one phenotypic ratio because this is round, this is round, so there are three round to one wrinkle. This is a simple monohybrid cross. A monohybrid cross is just a cross looking at a single trait. This, is, this thing is called a Punnett square, invented by a guy named Punnett. It's just an easy way of thinking about how you can combine gametes. So whenever you're working through a genetics problem, the first thing you have to figure out is what are the gametes? So, We'll give you a little problem here. I have a round plant and a wrinkled plant. When I cross these plants, so this is the parental generation, this is the F1 generation. When I cross these plants, I get half the population that is round and half the population that is wrinkled. Half the, half the offspring are round, half the offspring are wrinkled. How can this be? It's the round one is the like big R, little R, and the wrinkle is little R, little R. Okay. Come up here and demonstrate to us why that's the case. <coughs> it blocks right there. Explain to us what you're doing as you're doing it. So it's So, yeah, I raised that. So you're working with the parents. Yeah, so yep. the parents, one parent is right here. The other parent is down the side. Do you 
need both little ones though? Because this individual can only produce one gamete type. So do you need to have that same gamete listed twice? No. No, you don't. It's just it's just duplicate work. So you can actually just make your box smaller. And it becomes a little more intuitive. So you have this individual here. So always begin with gametes. So this individual can make this type of gamete, or it can make this type of gamete. This individual can only make this type of gamete. Those two gametes go there. That gamete goes here. What do you get in terms of genotypes? Make it more confusing than non scientists like me. Yeah, it's, it, you'll get the same answer. You'll just have to say, oh, there's four. Two fourths of them are one genotype, two fourths of them are the other genotype. As opposed to this, there's two, one half is one, one half is the other. You'll get to the same place, it just saves you a little bit of thought. Yeah, exactly. So I didn't tell you what the genotype was. You had to infer what the genotype was because I didn't use the word true breeding. Had I said true breeding, had I said I have a true breeding round parent and a true breeding wrinkled parent, there's no way you can get anything other than the round phenotype because true breeding implies that they're both parents are homozygous. But because I just said one parent is round, one parent is wrinkled, when you get this, you should then know that you couldn't get that recessive phenotype out of this cross unless this individual were heterozygous. This individual has to be homozygous, recessive. Otherwise, it wouldn't be wrinkled, it would be round. So the only one that you have to work with is, all you know when you're given round is that this individual has a dominant allele. If this individual has a dominant allele combined with another dominant allele, you would get 100% round if it has a recessive allele, you would get a 50-50 mixture of these two. Yeah? So why isn't tongue rolling like a 100% everybody can do it since like if... Because we have plenty of plenty of recessive allels floating around and plenty of homozygous recessive individuals. Would it not eventually dominate and like take over? No, from generation to generation it would stay kind of at the same ratio <coughs> that, it, that it currently is because there's no selective advantage to it. So alleles get fixed in populations when there's some advantage to one allele over another, or there's a disadvantage to one and not a disadvantage to the other. So imagine that you're at a bar. Somebody, you were talking about going out drinking this weekend. Imagine you're at a bar and you go up to some woman, it's not a dude, you go up to some woman and you're like, hey baby, how's it going? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. There is no selective advantage to having the ability to tongue roll. And if you think there is, people are going to slap you and you're going to figure out that there is no advantage. So because there's no advantage to it, it just it just kind of drifts around in frequency in a population because there's no advantage and there's also presumably no disadvantage to having it. And so whatever frequency that trait is at at the moment, that frequency just tends to keep being the same over time. It's, it's, it's subject to an evolutionary process that we call random genetic drift. So it will change frequency over time, but it won't change frequency in any particular direction. Yes, are you offended by my, no. by my example? I'm, I'm turning 21, so it's um, Oh, I don't care. I, I have no knowledge of anything. Uh, so not having um, wisdom teeth, isn't that genetic? Uh, so there is variation in wisdom teeth number and the presence of wisdom teeth and things like that. And what has happened over time is there is a disadvantage in some ways of having too many molars in your jaw. And over time, as our diet has changed, our jaw size has changed evolutionarily. All you have to do is go back and look at old hominid, old hominid uh, fossils where you have you know, a recessed forehead and these big jaws sticking out on the lower part. And so over evolutionary time, our jaw has gotten smaller and smaller as our diet has changed, which then creates less and less space for teeth. And so nowadays, your, your wisdom teeth can become impacted and things like that, and you have to get them removed. I didn't get mine removed until I was in graduate school. It wasn't pleasant. 
And so <coughs> we currently have this weird disconnect in our own bodies where we have a jaw that has receded evolutionarily in size over time, but there hasn't been strong enough selection to get rid of all of the teeth that, that used to be in our old jaws when our jaws were bigger. And so now our teeth have, you know, sometimes give us problems. So would you say in like a big time forward, we just like wouldn't have it because it's been there? Yeah, another 10,000 years, we would probably have fewer teeth than we currently have, sure. But consider, consider this from an evolutionary standpoint. We haven't talked about evolution yet. From an evolutionary standpoint, The Earth is 4.5 billion years old. Billion. One, two, three, four, five, six. That's a million. This is 4.5 billion. Ten thousand years ago. So 4.5 billion years ago. Earth was formed. 10,000 years ago, guess what every human on the planet was doing in terms of acquiring food? Every human on the planet 10,000 years ago. We were all hunter-gatherers. 10,000 years ago, we were all hunters. Think about it. In the blink of an eye, in terms of the total amount of time organisms have been around on, on the planet, which we didn't see the first organisms on the planet until about three and a half billion years ago. So the first billion years of the, Earth, uh, or the Earth's existence, there was nothing living on the planet. Bacteria appeared about 3.5 billion years ago. So compared to the whole time that organisms have been living on the planet, 10,000 years ago isn't that long. 10,000 years ago, we were all hunter-gatherers. And as a hunter-gatherer, we probably needed most of our teeth. Grinding a bunch of nuts and hard things, difficult to chew things. In 10,000 years, we've gone from being hunter-gatherers to gogurk. That's pretty good, though. <laughs> gogurk. It's pretty delicious. I've never had go here. That's a lot of change in terms of our food supply in a really short period of time. It's not surprising that we have dietary challenges because our food system that we have set up to feed us <coughs> has changed radically in the time that our evolution hasn't really had much time to catch up. Evolution is a slow process in many cases. Um, so in the PowerPoint here, there is uh, basically what we just did, which is this. And there are, this is two traits now, which we're not going to worry about two traits. So on the test, you're just going to have single trait. This is actually the example that we just worked through in class. And I worked it a couple ways, just starting out with pure breeding, true breeding organisms, and going through a standard monohybrid cross. And then I've also given you a problem where I didn't tell you what the genotype of organisms were, but because the offspring ratio didn't turn out the way you expected it to be, uh, you knew that there must be something different about those genotypes. And those are the kinds of problems that I'll put on the test. Those are also the kinds of problems that are on the first page of the, the practice set that I put uh, on the Moodle site. So go and work that first page in preparation for Monday. And we're out of time. So you guys wanted to do review?